And it is a Thursday time to talk to our good friend Brian Haney, the voice of the Jayhawks, uh, brought to you by Anderson Insurance Agency. We hope to be previewing the Sweet 16 matchup for KU uh, here either tonight or tomorrow night, but unfortunately um, it uh, is over. KU season ends in the second round to Gonzaga, and here to talk about it is Brian Haney, the voice of the Jayhawks. We'll talk a little baseball there at the end as well, as uh, Brian can't get enough of the state of Utah. He's back there again. Brian, my man, I, uh, you know, hey, this was one of those seasons where it just – didn't seem to go right from really before the season even began with Arturi Morris not being part of the team. Things looked uh, good in the in the in the summer trip and 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 so forth and so on. But it just never did fully come together because of uh, myriad of factors, huh? We did, and you know, the the Arturi Morris thing was a gigantic domino that fell early in the season, and I think that because we were preseason number one. And because there was such high expectation for all the other new pieces, most folks kind of just brushed that under the rug and said, "Ah, oh, it'll be fine." You know, it, you know, it's, it's one player. We've still got this core nucleus of Dewan, Kevin, Hunter, KJ, and then uh, Marcos and McDonald's All American. Nick was the most sought after shooting guard in the transfer portal. Would beat out UConn to get him. UConn had to settle for some guy named Cam Spencer as a result, who wound up being a superstar, um, and. You, know, you kind of felt like we can overcome that, but and clearly they they could have. But in a year where you were already down a couple of scholarships post NCAA investigation, yeah, Jack Clements redshirting, then you lose a five star guard who was not going to be a fill it up from three type guy, but he would have been the best example of anybody on the roster that could get their shot off the dribble. If the offense was breaking down, if the shot clock was dripping down, this guy could go out and get a bucket. And let's just call it like it is. This Kansas roster was largely devoid of that yeah. at the guard positions once Kevin started to, to be slowed by the knee injury. And so that was a massive sequence in events. But, um, you know, you overcome that if – Nick is as good as we thought he would be, or as consistent, let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. If El Marco blossoms quicker, um, clearly, I, th- I think a lot of Kansas fans just assume, well, you replace one McDonald's All-American with another, you plug El Marco in for Grady Dick, and you get similar results. And these were very different players with very different career arcs. In the case of El Marco, heading into this year, he'd only been playing organized basketball for about four and a half years. So for those in the know, they knew not to expect Grady Dick-like numbers. But at the same time, you had high, high hopes for this guy. He was a top 20 prospect. But it it never really clicked. And so um, it it started with the Arterio Domino, yes. But the disappointment of, you know, some of the other key pieces that just didn't blossom, the fact that they didn't recruit a backup big to the normal Kansas caliber of talent. And part of that is it's hard to get guys in the portal era to come back up an All-American center when you know he's going to play about 30 to 32 minutes a game and there's not much else left for you there. But that, that was clearly something vastly different. I mean, think about Self's first title team, all right? Mm-hmm. Who were the bigs on that team? Arthur, Jackson, Aldrich, Khan, mm-hmm. all of which future NBA guys. Uh, this team had Hunter, and then you know Parker Brown's a nice player, but on that 08 team would have been the fifth pick. Uh, on the 2022 team would have been the fourth pick. You know what I mean? And so this was not a roster built to withstand injury or ineffectiveness. And what we found with those other wing and guard pieces after Arterio left was that the cake did not bake as quickly as the recipe was calling for. Yeah. And, and therefore, without depth to turn to when other options were slow to sizzle, um, it, it definitely left Kansas a much more vulnerable team than what we're accustomed to seeing. Absolutely. And, we, you know, we could spend time talking about the Gonzaga game. I'm just going to summarize real quickly because, one, they ran out of gas second half. First half was fun to watch. If you're just a pure basketball fan, it was fun to watch. Uh, second half, Kansas couldn't make shots. Their defense, well, wasn't very good at all the whole game. The pick-and-roll defense was really, really poor. Uh, and they had a problem all year long. You and I have talked about it each and every week that they had a problem all year long, one, making three-pointers offensively, but also defending the three-point line. What would be your quick synopsis of – of what took place uh, in the loss to Gonzaga before we move on and look ahead to next year's possible roster? Well, you know, I thought the first half was as fun of a half that yeah. we had to call all year. But I mean, think about it, Wade. 
you're a play-by-play guy. Yeah. What do you love calling more than anything when it comes to, to highlights? There's, there's two kind of basketball highlights that a play-by-play guy lives for. Yep. Dunks and threes. Yep. And in that first half, keep in mind, we hadn't hit double-digit threes since week one of the season. Our first two games of the year, we had double-digit threes. We've not done it since at all. Zip, zero, nada. First half, we had seven, okay? Hunter Dickinson, who in the middle of Big 12 play had a five-week stretch of going three for 29 from three, hit two of them yeah. and, and had celebratory gestures running down the floor reminiscent of what we saw after the uh, halftime buzzer beater versus Kentucky in Chicago. And if you know, you know. So uh, that was a blast to call. Oh, my gosh. Seven threes, all these dunks, an alley-oop from 40 feet, point for point, your Magic Gonzaga, back and forth we go. I think it was like eight lead changes at that mm-hmm. point. It's a blast. And then they come out of the locker room. Timberlake hits the three right out the gates. But what did you notice after that? I mean, everything was short. Yep. And it, to me, it's, it started with Furphy. He missed three straight threes. And, and this is not being critical of Johnny, but when Gonzaga is scoring on the other end every single trip down and you missed on three straight possessions, it's one guy missing the shot, but for all five guys, that rim looks smaller and it gets a little tighter because all of a sudden, your two-possession lead, you're, you're down five, you're down seven, you're down nine, you're down 11, you're down 13, you're down 15. Oh my gosh, what's happening here? And, and the bricks just kept mounting. And if you go back and look at it, short, short, yep. short, wide right, short, short. They were gassed. And, you know, we wondered what effect playing late Thursday and then the quickest West Coast turnaround for a, a second game in tournament history I can remember based on TV. Uh, and I know you had a day in between, but literally they were on their feet for 15 minutes of a walkthrough and 20 minutes of shooting free throws, and that was it on Friday because they were trying not to you know, have this be a fatigued team. But you've got the altitude you're dealing with, a lack of depth, and I just think they expended – all of their best energy in those first 20 minutes, and then it was a snowball that we couldn't catch up to in the second half, and it was an avalanche. And, uh, you know, simply put, we weren't deep enough, we weren't good enough. And, you know, that their backup big in the first half, the reason why Gonzaga was even in the game, they turned to their reserve big, he gets them 11 points off the bench. Our guy, unfortunately, you know, was out there for 45 seconds and self was pulling right back to the bench and was frustrated. And it, it's a pretty glaring omission of, of uh, depth there, which goes back to the original question you asked. And it's just unkansas like But I promise you this, it won't be that way next year. And uh, we can talk about that a little bit as we get into roster construction for next year. But, you know, the, the vulnerabilities and susceptibilities of this year's Kansas team will be a blueprint of what to avoid going forward. And you won't have scholarship you know, restrictions to this degree. You won't have, um, I, I think, some overconfidence in, in, hey, we filled up on enough shooters here. I, I don't know that we'll ever have that again. I, I think now if, if they think they have enough shooters, they'll recruit two more, just to be sure. sure. Because, you know, you go from the, the 2018 Final Four season with Devontae Graham when they hit 391 threes. You had two guys that were, you know, top three individual seasons all time to a club this year where routinely we were hitting less than five in a game. And, and that's just no way to spread the floor. We knew we'd be big man and two-point dominant this year with a guy like Hunt. But Hunt's job is immeasurably easier when you've got real three-point shooting that spreads the floor and creates space for him. And we just didn't have that this year. So uh, I, I can give you the answer before you ask the next question about portal focus. Shooters, 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 <laughs> shooters, a backup big man, shooters, shooters, shooters. Yeah. And, uh, and and we'll see what it looks like. You're not going to take seven guys, but I just did that for emphasis. But that's uh, guys that can create off the bounce, yeah. guys that can you know shoot better than 40% from three. But, uh, but we also need a little bit of big man help. You're going to likely have Flory Bidunga come in and play the four, which would shift KJ to the bench should he elect to stay, and we all hope he does and, and you know, feel like he will. But he's going to have to accept a different role, and that's that's a major question for the offseason. But uh, beyond that, we, we just got to get guys that can score it. And, you know, your point guard is a guy that doesn't score like other point guards can in today's game. Now, DeWan's float game is really good, and, and the one anomaly on the schedule card this year was the Kentucky game when he hit five threes. But a lot of other guards, ball handlers, are, are not just 
pass first pass second pass third but they could score it and jump shoot it and, and break you down and blow by you off the bounce as easily as they can distribute and that's not to take anything away from the terrific skill set that DeWan has we love DeWan love DeWan but you know you're giving up a little bit there in terms of scoring punch uh, since he's a true pass first point guard and so you need to make sure those other wings not only can stroke it but they can get theirs off the bounce too and I think that's Yeah, and you, and you mentioned Harrison, his floater game. His floater game was not nearly as good this year as it's been in the past, and there's a lot of floaters that he normally would make that he didn't, so hopefully that comes back for him next year. Uh, we're joined, of course, by Brian Heaney, the voice of the Jayhawks, every Thursday here on The Ticket, brought to you by Anderson Insurance Agency. They do farm, home, auto life, and crop insurance. Stop by and see Matt and Becky, 118 North Mill and Beloit, or call them at 738-5701. Based on what you just said, Dickinson's coming back. We, we know he's coming back next year. Uh, I mean, it's not definitive, but we certainly feel like there's a great chance at that. Okay. I mean, I would phrase it this way. Could he transfer somewhere else in his final season if he felt like the fit was better? Sure. Um, but he's not going to go pro. I mean, he, he's not going to make as much money anywhere <laughs> right. else next year as he would make in NIL at Kansas. He's, he's just not a you know a first-round NBA draft pick with some of the um, athleticism you know, measurables that he needs to improve upon. It may never completely approved of on you know sometimes the guy's vertical leap is what it is and, and you know he's worked hard with Ramsey Nigem to enhance some of that but he's a really really good college player that uh, we're blessed to have but I think there's some limitations athletically that is why he's talking about a fifth year in college and not being off to the NBA after his second year I mean based on the counting stats he would have the production to be an NBA considered guy but have you seen one mock draft that has him on it right no, so you know it, it's it's likely come back for understanding that like his biggest earning potential as a basketball player is cashing in on the current name, image, and likeness landscape of the college game. That's not to say he can't play somewhere professionally and make a lot of money, but right now <laughs> the makings are good yes. at the collegiate level if you're a star. And so I'd be really surprised to see him walk away from that. He likes Bill Self. He's getting great big man coaching here. I think he'll have an easier job next year with better floor spacing like we talked about. So I would be really, really surprised if, if he's not in a Kansas uniform. One guy we I don't think we mentioned, uh, what about Johnny Furphy? There's been some talk he could go to the NBA draft, uh, others saying that he'll come back. Well, what can you tell us about Furphy and, uh, and next year possibly? That's the multi-multi-million dollar question. And, uh, you know, if you ask the young man, he'll tell you, I don't know yet. I haven't been thinking about it. Um, you have to think about it, though, and you have to wonder if he's reading the mocks and all that. As we've addressed a couple of times on these reports going back to mid-January when he started climbing up the mock drafts, 2024 is a, I don't want to say historically weak draft, but a eye-openingly weak draft, yes. a jaw-droppingly weak draft. Put it in perspective, I mean, Kevin McCuller hasn't really played in two months, and he's still a top-20 pick, yeah. okay? Um, and that's not being critical. That's just saying, like, that's the landscape of, of what we're dealing with here. And that's a 23-year-old that, you know, is a really good player, but, like, usually in a normal draft year, what, what we just witnessed out of him over the last eight weeks would cause a guy to plummet uh, based on availability and the bounce back and all that. And he hasn't. In Furphy's case... When he was cooking over those first seven games as a starter, when he was scoring 15, averaging seven rebounds and 48% from three, he vaulted up into like the low 20s. And then the Athletic, with a pretty credible writer, had him 13th, okay? And I remember talking to you about that off the air and saying, wait a minute, a week ago, before he started starting for us, he was like seventh on our roster. Yeah. Now you're telling me he's 13th on the world's roster of draftable players? I mean, that, that seems, wow. You know, obviously his numbers came down to earth a bit. Obviously when Kevin started to get hurt, Johnny was more of a marked man. And uh, he still did some amazing things. This is a guy who crashes the glass and flies in. I love the nickname Captain Kangaroo because he kind of hops over you and, and is so great on the offensive glass. But here's the deal. Guarding grown men, like college men, the 22, 23-year-olds, was an issue at times. He had deflections and steals, don't get me wrong, sure. but, but bounce for bounce, stride for stride, step for step, staying in front of these guys was an issue. 
Now ask him to go guard LeBron tomorrow. The, the point is, there is some maturation that still needs to happen in his game. There's some growing up and some developing physically that still needs to happen. Could he be drafted this year and, and have a nice pro career? Absolutely. And I'm a huge fan of his, and I, I will cheer for him whatever he decides. But could he benefit a ton by coming back and getting the coaching at Kansas where he'll be an alpha scorer on the perimeter, he'll have the ball in his hands in all the key moments, as opposed to a guy that, quite frankly, based on some of those defensive limitations, would spend much of the year on a two-way contract bouncing back and forth um, you know, between the G League and, and up with the, the main club. And so it's a guy that, that I think would really benefit by coming back. Having said that, though, even though he had some clunker of stat lines in the last three weeks, Still projected late first, so um, you know twenty seven, twenty eight range. So you know my hope is that, that he comes back, and, and that's a little bit selfish, but a lot of it uh, seeing the big picture and understanding that in the NBA it's all about your second contract, not your first. I think though a much deeper draft in twenty twenty five, he would be a much more NBA ready player to make a profound impact out the gate than than a guy right now that is still raw in some ways and please hear that in a constructive tone sure. not in a critical one at all we're just you know kind of sizing it up as we see it but what a great kid what a great talent and, and what a tremendous opportunity should he come back to be not just one of the faces of kansas basketball but i mean he, he's first team all big 12 if he comes back yeah the big wild card here is what you stated and that is that the draft is weak because in a normal situation i don't think we're having this discussion i think we're pretty much saying he's definitely or probably more than likely coming back and so and that's the thing he's got to think about is okay if i if i come back to kansas i i might improve i might become a better player but i actually might be not as high in the draft because 2025 might be a stronger, deeper draft. And so those are things that he and his representation have to figure out. I'm always for whatever's best for the kid. And if, if the kid and the family says, Hey, you know, this is what I want to do. And you've, you've earned that opportunity. Uh, albeit for me to say selfishly, you should play at KU because I know lots of KU fans. And it's not just KU fans that I know that they, they go, oh, you got to come back. You'll be better in college. And I'm like, yeah, but Grady Dick can make a lot of money and he can go play against NBA caliber players every day in practice and he'll be better in practice every single day. And playing in the G League will get him probably better prepared in the NBA games or getting promoted to the NBA roster than playing at KU uh, for another year. But it just depends on the kid. Sometimes you say mentally maybe they're not ready or physically they're not ready. But, you know, we've seen many, many players that go to the NBA and and, and you say, oh, should have should have come back to college. You know what? They also cashed a pretty big check. So it's easy for us to say, well, you should come back because that helps my team. And then they go to the NBA and then fans just kind of forget all about them, discard them, and don't really keep track of whether or not they're doing well or not. Yeah, and I think, I think the difference with Johnny is he's not a fringe prospect. He's going to make it regardless. Uh-huh. It's just a matter of when. And then what does that first splash look like? Not financially but contribution-wise. Yeah. And that's where I think there's a valid case to be made for how much more NBA-ready his body would be mm-hmm. and his games development with an additional year of seasoning here in college. Sure. And I just think I think he could be he could be a star, but he, he's got to have some more seasoning, and many times that's difficult to get if you're the 13th man on the end of an NBA roster bench and you're playing four minutes a game. And then, like I say, your, your real check cashing happens on the second contract. Yeah. And are, are you, you know, being flushed through the system at that point, or are you on the brink of, of a really to-the-moon trajectory-type career? And that's why a lot of guys betting on themselves by investing in one more year of development put themselves in position for much more immediate impact and therefore a lot bigger payday on, on that, that second contract. Yep. No, I totally agree with you on, on all of that. And, uh, and then, you know, if you're going to be a late first round pick, you got room to move up. If you're going to be a lottery pick, uh, you know, like we talked about with Grady Dick, it's, it's hard to say, come back if you're going to be a lottery pick and, and be in the top part of the first round. So we'll see how that all, all plays out. But uh, there's no doubt, as you said earlier, this roster is going to be vastly different next year. And, and it's, uh, it, and, and like you said, shooters, shooters, and more shooters shooters uh you're covering a baseball team you like utah so much that you're back in utah after being salt lake city you're in provo now for byu and ku baseball let's see today two o'clock uh, is the first pitch against byu central time and it's first of three uh just tell me a little bit about the baseball team real quickly before we get to off the wall i know they're 12 and 10 overall four and five in conference play 
All right, so we have uh, Brian back with us here on the air. I-, I just thought that you were offended by the fact that you like Utah so much. I was just saying you like Utah so much, you you went back to Utah, and then boom, Brian's like, I'm out of here. I don't want to talk about Utah anymore. But I'm kidding, of course. Uh, Brian Hayne, the voice of Jayhawks, with us. As you got baseball today, as KU takes on BYU, the first of three, they're 12-10 and 10 overall, 4-5 and five in conference play. Before we get to the off the wall and let you go, Brian, just a, a quick little uh, snippet uh, that you can tell us about the baseball program. Yeah, they're, they're doing well. Uh, you know, obviously we all saw the uh, series win over number three TCU a couple weeks back. Since then, they've uh, won one out of three versus both Cincinnati on the road and Central Florida at home. And, you know, they've, they've struggled to get wins over the weekend after winning on Friday night with a preseason second team All American, Reese Dutton. He's the real deal. He's as good of a Friday night starter as we've had in some time. And Colin Baumgartner was really good last year. But uh, this is a program on the rise. They're, they're fun to watch. They, they swing it. They play really clean defense. And uh, it's a club that, you know, in a very competitive Big 12 conference, you know, will we'll certainly compete to be in the Big 12 tournament and have a chance, an outside chance, at making an NCAA regional this year if they can start to string it together on the weekends. But I've never seen in 20 years of doing KU baseball um, a staff ERA where your weekend starters ERAs are 2.57, 1.97, 2.16. That's what we're talking about. So this is a vastly improved pitching staff and the KU program on the rise and an absolutely beautiful setting for baseball. Again, in 20 years of doing this, I've never seen a backdrop like this stadium that is sitting at the base of the mountains and the mountains are right on top of you. Mm. It's incredible. You think West Virginia is pretty? This takes it to a whole different level. So, uh, looking forward to it. We'll have a call for you on the Kansas Athletics app and the Jayhawk Network for the next three days, starting with today's game at two o'clock Central. All right, real quickly, let's go to the Sweet Sixteen games tonight. I just want your quick picks, okay? You ready for this? We got sure. Arizona and Clemson tonight. Who you like, Arizona or Clemson? I got Arizona in the Final Four. Okay. All right. Uh, I I did that last year and it it blew up my bracket. So, uh, UConn and San Diego State. Not stopping Coach Hurley right now, man. This guy's rolling. I think Con. this. I think this is a dangerous game for UConn a little bit, but uh, I'm with you. I think they'll find a way. Alabama, North Carolina might be the most entertaining game of the night. It'll be a lot of points, I would imagine. Who do you like? Uh, Carolina. Okay, but, but a lot of points. Yeah. Illinois and Iowa State. I'm actually picking Illinois in this one. I have Iowa State in my bracket. Illinois seems to be playing some good ball right now. I think this is a tough one to pick. Who are you picking there? I had Illinois when, I, when the brackets came out, and I'll stand by it, but I really love TJ, and I love that program. But uh, I think Illinois, just a little bit too much veteran talent. All right, tomorrow night, Sweet 16, NC State Marquette. Does NC State continue Cinderella run, or are they done? Uh, I got Marquette advancing to the Elite Eight. Okay, I got them in the Final Four. Gonzaga and Purdue. Uh, I got Purdue in the Final Four, so I get them beating Marquette. Okay, and Duke-Houston. Uh, I've got Houston. Okay. You know. And then oh, Creighton, Tennessee. It, I don't have the bracket in front of me. Would, would it be Houston, Marquette, or Purdue, Marquette? Uh, it'd be Houston. It'd be, Purdue, it'd be Tennessee. It'd be Houston and uh, Marquette, and then yeah. it would be Purdue, right. Tennessee. Yeah. Creighton, and Tennessee. Are you taking it. Tennessee? I am. I okay. am. But, you know, that could go either way. But I saw them up close, and, and Dalton connects the real deal, and I've uh, got, got Tennessee advance. Well, what'd you do? Just go chalk across your whole bracket? One and two, one and two, one and two. That's <laughs> yeah, there, there were a lot of them, but, you know, this is also a rare weekend where all ones yeah. and all twos advance to the Sweet 16. And True. My, my, my final four had three ones, and then Arizona is the two. So a lot of chalk, but this was a year where I think the chalk was the right call. That's funny. I have three ones, and I have a two. My two is Marquette, and I have the other three ones. I got Purdue winning it all. Who do you have? UConn back to back? I do. Oh, I hate that. See, I didn't want to do that. I couldn't I feel good do about it, don't you? I I, mean, I, it's, it's, I, it sucks. I, 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 don't, I don't feel good that it could happen because we're basketball, you know, biased to Kansas, and we want to have the right. you know, superlative uh, uh, accolades in our favor, but – yeah, they look so freaking good. They do. They do. Odds are against them, but then again, the odds were against the Chiefs, and they got it done and went back-to-back. Maybe this is the year of the repeat in sports. We shall see. Okay, uh, off-the-wall question for you. You kind of answered already. Best thing about Utah, and you talked about that backdrop and with baseball today, so I'll take that as your answer for that one. Uh, not really off-the-wall too much, sports-related, but the Royals open up the season today in Major League Baseball, and that's one thing that's great about baseball. You feel like weather, warmer weather is here or coming very, very soon. You got a Royals prediction record wise on, on how they'll do this year? 
You know, I haven't looked at the over-unders um, and, and, and where they're being projected, but i tell you what, I've looked a lot at their roster. I think Cole Reagans is a breakout superstar on the mound. He's touching 99 with excellent movement. I think that, um, you know, if, if they get Pasquatch to stay healthy, uh, Pasquatino, you know, he's, he's a first-base corner infield guy with a lot of pop that can flirt with 300. Obviously, Salvi's back. Obviously, Bobby Witt is a top-three player in the game today. So I think there's a lot of talent to be excited about, and uh, I think it's a Royals program that within a, a wide-open AL Central could really make some noise this year and, and flirt with making the postseason. Over-under for wins for the Royals, 73-and-a-half or 74-and-a-half? Over or under on that? Oh, I'm taking the over. Yeah, yeah me I'm too. Over, but, again, I, I can't give gambling advice. Sure, no, I know, I got it. You're not. Right? You're not. If, you're not. If, if we were just talking fans, I, I would be very uh, encouraged with that number. I got 82 and 80. That's my prediction. Do you think better or worse okay. than 82 and 80? I like that. No, I, I, I think they, they could use that as a starting point yep. and, and maybe sneak up to 84, 85. I agree with you. You want a fun nugget about college basketball I just found here? Um, sure. We talk about guys that are coming back, like Hunter Dickinson. We expect them to be back, and it's, it makes sense for him to come back and so forth and so on. Oklahoma City Thunder starting five lineup, and they're the number two seed in the West right now. Their average age of the Thunder in the NBA starting lineup is 22 and a half years of age. The starting lineup for North Carolina is 22.2. Wow. How about that? Isn't that something? Uh, that is something. A lot of the guys that KU face in that title game are, are still playing, one of which plays for Arizona. So if that yes. Elite Eight matchup that we forecast happens, yeah. Caleb Love versus North Carolina, Armando Baycott, R.J. Davis, all these guys that were on our spotting board two years ago <laughs> still playing for the biggest mistakes. I'm glad we already got our ring uh, tucked away and secured, but it's, it's uh, exciting to watch them still try to go get there. So. It is. Hey, man, is this the last time we talked to you for a little while until maybe spring football? What are we thinking? Yeah. Yeah, you probably do a, a spring wrap-up or preview, however you want to dice it. But, sure. yeah, our, our spring showcase is, is coming up here in a couple of weeks, so maybe the week of the game um, or just after we can. But, yeah, looking forward to it, buddy, and thanks for a great season of coverage throughout. Absolutely. Wish it went a little bit longer, but it is what it is. We appreciate all your help and your time being flexible. Have a great call out there in the wonderful scenery of Utah, and we'll talk to you again soon, my friend. Hey, thanks, buddy. Really appreciate you. Take care. Brian Haney, the voice of the Jayhawks, brought to you each and every Thursday by Interest Insurance Agency. They do farm, home, auto, life, and crop insurance. Stop by and see Matt and Becky, 118 North Mill in Beloit, or call them at 738-5701.